What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is a quick detour from the Dynasty Running Back Rankings videos. I've been putting out two of them dropped, top 10 and top 20 Dynasty Running Backs, top 30 Dynasty Running Backs, really RB21 through 30, to come on Sunday. But today's video is a quick break from that. I'm going to be talking about some players outside of the top 30 some running backs outside the top 30 who I believe could enter the top 30 by this time next season or by next off season in general. Really the parameters I use are players who are outside of my personal top 40 as well as outside of top 40 in ADP. It's easy to pick a guy being taken at like RB 33 and say like, oh, he could enter the top 30. Like, okay, he's got to jump four spots. So I'm taking guys outside the top 40 right now who could by next season gain at least 10 spots in value in the running back ranks and enter the top 30 of ADP. Guys going late who could end up being fantasy relevant by next offseason. I got two rookies, two vets. Let's get into it. The first guy I want to talk about is Kenneth Gainwell, who I was a big fan of coming out of Memphis. He only played one year in college, and so... I guess when I'm deciding, like, who of these guys could enter the top 30 by next offseason, I want to answer, like, two different questions. Number one, is this guy a good player? I think in Dynasty in general, I want to roster good players. I'm not making rankings decisions generally or um, ownership decisions based on short-term situational factors, like who's this guy's quarterback, who, which coach did this guy you know, end up with or, you know, whatever those things are. I want players who are good, especially at the back end of my roster, because those are the guys who can like ascend depth charts and turn out to be good players from the back of depth charts, from low draft capital, from late in dynasty drafts. I just want to fill my dynasty team with good players. Good things happen to good players because they make good things happen. So that's the first question I want to ask myself. Is this guy a good player? And then after that, I want to ask myself, what is this player's like conceivable path to like a value increase, to jumping into the top 30. So that's more of like situational factors. It ties into his, you know, inherent ability a little bit, but that's more of like paint the picture of, of what needs to transpire for this guy to get a value bump into the top 30. So to answer that first question about Kenneth Gainwell, number one, we have very little to go off of for him, honestly. He played four games, touched the ball, I think, 10 times his first season at Memphis back in, I believe that was 2018. And so he played four games, ended up sitting out the rest of the year, taking a redshirt year. Um, and then he played 14 games after like Daryl Henderson and Antonio Gibson left. Um, he played 14 games as the lead back in 2019, sat out the COVID year in 2020, and then entered the NFL draft and played 14 games for the Eagles last season. So we have one year of college and one year of NFL production to go off of for Kenneth Gainwell. But we can still like gain some insights from those sorts of things. Going back to his time in college, that 2019 season, he posted a 27.5% dominator rating, which is in the 76th percentile for year two college running backs who would go on to be drafted into the NFL. So an above average season. And yeah, he played for Memphis, which is not a power five program, but A, they went 12 and two that year. B, they finished ranked 17th in the country in the AP poll. And according to Bill Connolly's S&P Plus rating system, which is sort of like a, I don't know, like a schedule agnostic way of hypothetically pitting college football teams against each other. It's a, a objective ranking system. They were of 68th percentile quality relative to like the teams of running backs who go on to be drafted. So they didn't lose very many games. They were one of the top 25 teams in the country and you know, relative to historical teams of historical running back prospects, they were like in the top third of like team quality. And they've put out multiple NFL backs in the last couple of years, like multiple quality NFL backs, Tony Pollard, Daryl Henderson, Antonio Gibson, all good NFL players. So Kenny Gainwell was on a good team, a really good team, and he was dominant on that team and to a 76th percentile degree. And he was really good as a runner. He averaged 1.96 yards per carry greater than the other running backs at Memphis, which is a fairly talented group. And he did that by seeing 0.11 more defenders in the box on his average carry than other Memphis running backs did. So Kenny Gainwell is not very big. He's like 5'8", 5'9", 200 pounds. He was listed at like 5'11", 191 back in college. And, you know, great pass catcher. You would think like this guy's playing on passing downs. Teams aren't stacking the box against him. That wasn't the case. He was seeing heavier boxes than the other guys in the team and outdoing them by nearly two yards per carry. And that created a box adjusted efficiency rating, which measures, given the box counts that he's seeing, relative to the rest of his teammates, like what is the average carry worth 
for Kenny Gainwell, it was worth 161% the output of the average carry for all non-Gainwell running backs at Memphis that year. That's a 95th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, and he was succeeding on a large percentage of his carries as well. Succeeding like given down in distance, given the box counts that he's seeing relative to his teammates, 6% more often than the other backs at Memphis. That's in the 80th percentile in relative success rate on 228 rush attempts. So it was a pretty like substantial workload for a small guy. And I alluded to his receiving ability a little bit earlier. He had an 85th percentile target share. He caught 51 passes that year. He was split out wide or in the slot almost 30% of the time. That's in the 94th percentile. Targeted downfield 2.58 dot that's in the 85th percentile and on those advanced targets like not just exclusively out of the backfield he's being split out wide he's being moved into the slot he's being targeted downfield even on those advanced targets his catch rate was 83.6 percent that's in the 78th percentile for running back prospects he was an, an incredibly dynamic receiver in college on top of being an incredibly dynamic runner and then what did we see from him in the nfl last year 67 carries and on those 67 carries he was trash like he was very very bad His box-adjusted efficiency rating last year was 84.3%, which means the average carry for Kenny Gainwell, given the box counts that he's seeing, was worth only 84% the output of the average carry for all other Eagles running backs. So, very bad. That means if everybody else is averaging, what, like five yards a carry on the Eagles, that means he's barely averaging like 4.2 or something. And he was succeeding relative success rate negative 2.6% of the time relative to the other Eagles backs, far fewer than they were. That's in the 38th percentile. He was just really bad last year. One of the one of the worst running backs on a per carry basis among like backs with like legitimate volume. However, he was really good as a receiver. He had 50 targets, which is solid for like a part-time player. And he was 39th in routes run, 39th in the entire league in routes run among running backs, which is not very high, obviously, like there's only 32 teams, but he was 16th in target share among running backs. And that means his, his targets per route run on player profiler, they call that metric hog rate, was number one in the NFL. 18.2% was the rate at which he was targeted on his routes. Number one in the NFL among all running backs, higher than guys like J.D. McKissick, Naeem Hines, every other running back in the league. And so what do we conclude about whether Kenny Gainwell is good or not? My conclusion is maybe. He was a very bad runner last season by almost any objective measure, but the Eagles did make him a very concerted effort to like get him the ball as a receiver. And he was good enough in college to earn a mulligan from, from me at least for his like terrible performance on the ground last season. And so I'm holding out hope for one more year that Kenny Gainwell can like put it together as a runner. I think he's proven that he's a quality receiver in college and he did in the NFL last year. If he can return to form as a runner, even add just a little bit more juice, I think he's a good player. And then so given that, what is his path to the top 30? Step one to doing that is leveraging running the ball better into just earning more opportunities. Like he was even behind Miles Sanders last year. He was splitting time with like Boston Scott. He needs to not do that anymore. He needs to supplant at least Boston Scott. I think Miles Sanders has been a little bit up and down in his career. He was an efficient guy last year. That's been a little bit of an issue for him, especially on like down to down consistency goes throughout his career. And he's a terrible pass catcher. So there's opportunity here for a running back who can like put it all together to, you know, kind of earn a larger workload. Gainwell, I think, is the likeliest candidate to do that. He just needs to like take it upon himself to play better and put himself in that position. So step one is leveraging running better into earning more opportunities. And step two is Miles Sanders leaves in free agency. He's in the last year of his deal. I'm not sure that the Eagles re-sign him. Who really knows? But especially if Kenny Gainwell plays better. Like, I think this situation is in Gainwell's hands. If step one happens, if he leverages running better into earning more opportunities, proving to Eagles coaches that, like, he deserves more run because he's playing well, step two, Miles Sanders leaving in free agency, is more likely to follow. So, really, what this comes down to Him jumping into the top 30 of Dynasty running back rankings is very much just dependent on can Kenny Gainwell play better in year two than he did in year one. We saw him play better in college than he did in year one. I'm optimistic for another year in on Kenny Gainwell. What are the odds it happens? Maybe like 30% or something like that. But I think that's enough to take a shot on. He's currently going at like RB52 or something. I, I don't remember. I didn't write it down, but... He's not going in the top 40 running backs, and so I think he's a fairly low cost of acquisition asset here who could jump up given like the extreme dynamism we saw from him in college. The next guy who could jump into the top 30 is a rookie, Tyrion Davis-Price, and back to that first question, is he a good player? 
let's see. He was somewhat productive in college. Um, he kind of he played behind Clyde edwards as a rookie. There were some other guys there. Um, John Emery was there. Uh, like Chris Curry, some other some other like highly recruited running backs there at LSU. But he was able to pull away from them in 2021. He had over a thousand yards on the ground that year, just under a 20% dominator rating on a not very good LSU team. They only went six and seven, and that 20% dominator rating was in the 38th percentile for NFL running back prospects. And so not absolutely horrible, but like not particularly impressive. He had a thousand yards in the SEC, but wasn't overly involved in the offense for a lead back on a team that wasn't great in the context of like other teams of NFL running backs. And so production, meh. As a runner, though, really solid. In 2020, his box adjusted efficiency rating was 112%. So the average carry for him was worth over 110% the output of the other runners at LSU, a talented group, and his relative success rate that year was 9.1%. So he was succeeding on almost 10% more of his carries than the other LSU backs, a group that averaged 3.41 stars as high school recruits. That's in the 80th percentile. So he was more efficient and more consistent than a really talented group of running backs. And then the next year, as the lead back at LSU, his box-adjusted efficiency rating went up to 112.8, so almost 130 13%, and his relative success rate went from 9.1 to 11. So he did the same thing, but a little bit better on higher volume and against running backs who averaged 3.58 stars as high school recruits. So his teammates were a little bit more talented. He had a little bit more volume and he was a little bit more efficient and a little bit more consistent. Like he was really on a per carry basis last year, one of the best running backs in the entire SEC. He was just a really solid two down runner. I think he only had 10 receptions as a receiver, just 3.4% target share, 28 career receptions in 35 games. Not great. His true catch rate, which just looks at like which targets j just among the targets that were like catchable. So his quarterback sails it over his head. Doesn't count. His quarterback throws in the dirt. Doesn't count. Just the ones that were, you know, deemed catchable by game charters, 80% true catch rate. Second worst in this class behind only Kevin Harris on a negative 0.2 a dot, which is in the 38th percentile. So easy targets just being thrown the ball behind the line of scrimmage. He's not being moved around the formation much. And even on those passes, he's not catching an impressive amount of them. Doesn't speak well to his ability as a receiver. I don't think he's a three down back at this point, like really at all, but he was relatively athletic at the combine. He ran four, four, eight and had a 55th percentile burst score, not incredibly agile, but he did that at six feet tall, three eighths of an inch and 211 pounds, which is a little bit interesting because throughout his college career, he was as a recruit, he was like 235 pounds as a recruit, 226 pounds as a freshman, 232 pounds as a sophomore, 220, I forget what it was, like 225 pounds as a junior, 211 at the Combine. On the 49ers website right now, he's listed at 220 or 219, I believe, right now. And so this man like starved himself to get down to 211 so he could run fast at the Combine and then is bulking back up now, apparently. Like he's not going to play at 211. I don't think he runs sub 4.5 at his playing weight. But still, I think he's a decent athlete at worst. And so the conclusion, like, is he good or not? I think probably. I don't know that he's some sort of excellent player, but I think he's a good player. I think he's a solid two-down pounder. And so to answer the question of, like, what is his path to the top 30, step one is be a San Francisco running back. And check. Like, he already did that. He got drafted by San Francisco in, what was it, like the third round? And step two, when you're a San Francisco running back with decent speed, good instincts at the line of scrimmage, and can, like, make things happen at the second level like this guy can, given the box-adjusted efficiency rating, given the relative success rate we saw from him in college, he can make good choices at the line of scrimmage and maximize yardage on a given play. Step two for a guy like that in San Francisco is just let the bullshit happen. Like every single year, San Francisco sees another running back, Matt Breida or Raheem Mostert or Jeff Wilson, or, you know, then it was Elijah Mitchell. And then if the bullshit happens again, at some point, it's going to be Tyrion Davis Price's turn. And once that happens, he's going to be a top 30 running back. I don't know if that happens, but given the history we've seen from the Shanahan backfield, you got to just take shots on good players who end up in this spot I think Davis Price is that, and maybe things fall out in such a way that he's the lead back this year, or Elijah Mitchell gets hurt, or Elijah Mitchell doesn't play as well, and TDP can step in. There are lots of pads for this to happen. It's San Francisco. Who the fuck knows? But he's good. Crazy things happen here. Just take shots late in Dynasty drafts. The third guy I want to talk about is another rookie, and this is Isaiah Spiller. 
I have made a point in this video to talk about pretty much exclusively players who I haven't been, you know, kind of high on this offseason, guys who I haven't been standing very hard. Isaiah Spiller is definitely that. I'm very low on Isaiah Spiller. So to answer the question of whether or not he's good, my answer is I don't believe so. I mean, my first video, I think, on this channel was about Isaiah Spiller. I've, I've addressed him a couple times, written a couple articles this offseason about him. So check those out if you haven't seen them. But just like real quick, in 2019, his box-adjusted efficiency rating was 99.5%, so just barely underperforming the other backs on the team in terms of, like, overall efficiency. But that's in the 48th percentile for college runners and in the 17th percentile for NFL prospect runners. And his relative success rate that year was negative 6.3%, so he was succeeding succeeding on more than 6% less of his carries than the other backs at Texas A&M, which is the second lowest mark among lead backs in the SEC. The next season, in 2020, his box-adjusted efficiency rating was 72.5%, which is just absolutely incredibly bad. That means if the other guys on the team were averaging five yards a carry, he was averaging like three and a half. So just absolutely terrible. That was in the 15th percentile for college runners, would be the lowest by far if it was a career mark for like NFL prospect backs. And his relative success rate with that that season was negative 16.5%. He was succeeding on 16% fewer of his carries than other backs on the team. That, that was the lowest among lead backs in the SEC easily. And the next lowest wasn't even negative 12%. So he was like by far the least successful back on a per carry basis relative to the offensive environment he was playing in. That's also third lowest among lead backs in the Power 5 conferences in the last four years. Like he was historically absolutely terrible relative to what his teammates were doing in 2020. In 2021, his box adjusted efficiency rating was 98.8%. So similar to what he was doing as a freshman, just a little bit less efficient than his teammates. And his relative success rate was negative 7.7%. Still really bad. Lowest among lead backs in the SEC. The next lowest guy was at negative 4%. So he was just really bad. And yeah, those last two years, Devon A-Chain was on the team. Super fast, super good. I love Devon A-Chain. He's a super dynamic player. And so the team relative metrics are a little bit tough for Isaiah Spiller to look good in, given that Devon A-Chain is so good. But if you check out the, the video I made earlier in the offseason, um, we've seen guys like Samaj P. Ryan, Lendale White, James White. I don't know. They're just like a bunch of different dudes who throughout history have been less efficient than super dynamic teammate running backs in college. And it hasn't meant anything good for them in the NFL. Like caveating their team relative efficiency was like with like, but that other guy was really good, so we shouldn't care, has historically been bad process. And we saw Isaiah Spiller be really bad relative to his teammates as a freshman when Devon Achen wasn't even on the team. So I don't think Isaiah Spiller is a particularly good runner. He was a decent receiver in college, but there could still be conceivably a path for him to move into the top 30 of dynasty running backs after the season. Step one to that is earn a legitimate role in the Chargers offense. And I think the Chargers have attempted to plug in like an Isaiah Spiller type back next to Austin Eckler ever since Melvin Gordon left in free agency a couple years ago. They've tried Larry Roundtree. They tried Kalen Balaj, They've tried Joshua Kelly. Really, the only guy who's been effective has been a guy who doesn't fit that mold at all in Justin Jackson. But I think they want a bigger back to pair with Austin Eckler. Isaiah Spiller, I don't know that he's like in a vacuum much better than Joshua Kelly, but I think the Chargers coaches probably think that, and there's a chance that I'm just a little bit wrong about my evaluation, you know, relative to those two. And so the first step for Isaiah Spiller here is just earn a legitimate role in the offense. Like B, maybe not even the one B, but just like the clear number two to Austin Eckler. Step two is score some touchdowns. I think we want high leverage roles for our fantasy running backs. Isaiah Spiller is not going to be the main pass catching back here, given that Austin Eckler is in the offense. Um, I don't think they're going to yank Austin Eckler off the field on first and second down and just relegate him to third down duties. And so Isaiah Spiller needs to be the goal line pounder on this team in order to see like fantasy production in the case that Austin Eckler remains healthy throughout the season. So score some touchdowns. Step three is that Austin Eckler gets cut this offseason. He's got four years left on his deal, but they've got an out in his contract following the season where like the dead cap drops to a point where like it's reasonable for them to cut him and move on. He's getting a little bit older. If he loses a step, he could just become a cap casualty. And if that happens and Isaiah Spiller like played decently well, scored some touchdowns. Maybe the Chargers don't have a plan for Isaiah Spiller to be the lead back. Maybe they do. But even if they don't, if Os Neckler gets cut, Dynasty people who love Isaiah Spiller are going to be like, oh shit, like this backfield's wide open for Isaiah Spiller to step in. They got Justin Herbert. He's going to be the RB1 on an elite offense. He's going to, his, his dynasty value is going to shoot way up with Austin Eckler out of the picture, even temporarily. And so that's the path. Earn a roll, score some touchdowns, Eckler gets cut, Spiller top 30. 
The last guy I want to talk about is the second veteran on the list, Daryl Henderson, who I'm cheating on a little bit. I believe he's RB52 in ADP right now. I have him at RB40, and so he's not outside my top 40, but he's right on the fringe. But the question of whether or not he's good, I think is clearly a yes. Back at Memphis, he was one of the most dynamic running backs in the country. Back in 2018, his final year there, he ran for 1,900 yards on 8.92 yards per carry obviously ridiculous, but we have seen guys, you know, we've seen Tony Pollard, Antonio Gibson when he was taking carries out of the backfield, um, even like Patrick Taylor, Kenneth Gainwell. We've seen tons of guys come through this Memphis offense and produce like ridiculous numbers, but Daryl Henderson was good even in the context of that offense. His box adjusted efficiency rating in 2018 was 150%. So if the other backs in the team were averaging five yards a carry, he was averaging seven and a half. Like he was just producing 50% greater than what they were producing on top of what he's doing. However, his relative success rate was negative 0.7%. And so despite incredibly high efficiency, he was succeeding on slightly less of his runs than the other backs in the team were. That speaks to a high degree of volatility. And his volatility rating, which I generate using the percentile ranks, the relationship between the percentile ranks of those two metrics, was the second highest among 200 carry backs in 2018, behind only Travis on Williams in the entire country. So Daryl Henderson, super volatile runner in college, but super efficient. He was, you know, super explosive in the open field, creating big plays, really productive. And then when he came to the NFL in 2019, he was a similar player as a rookie. His box adjusted efficiency rating, 103%. And so, you know, he's not blowing NFL dudes out of the water the same way he was the guys at Memphis, but he was still more efficient than the collective other backs on the Rams. But his relative success rate was negative 5.8%. So still succeeding on substantially fewer of his carries now than the other guys in the Rams while being more efficient than them overall. So high volatility again. But then the last two seasons in 2020 and 2021, he completely corrected that. His box adjusted efficiency ratings those years, 115%, 117%. So he became much more efficient relative to the context of the offense he's operating in and became much more consistent on a per carry basis. 8.6% relative success rate, 8.3% relative success rate. He's been tremendously consistent on a per carry basis the last two years, been essentially the exact same player the last two years. Really one of the most consistent down-to-down -down runners in the NFL, one of the most efficient down-to-down -down runners in the NFL. He's just been really, really good as a pure runner the last two years. And as a receiver in college, caught a lot of passes, 63 passes in 38 games, high ADOT, 2.2 yards downfield. That's in the 83rd percentile. And on those passes, 86.4% catch rate. That's in the 85th percentile. So highly involved as a receiver, targeted downfield, used as a downfield passing weapon, catching a high percentage of his passes. Those are all good things. I think he was a dynamic receiver in college. He hasn't been used there a ton in the NFL, but I think he has that in sort of the back of his pocket on top of him being an effective per carry runner. So what is his path to the top 30? Well, right now, step one is just be healthy. Cam Akers is coming off the torn Achilles. He seems to be healthy right now in camp. Daryl Henderson is currently not. He's dealing with some sort of undisclosed, unspecified soft tissue injury. He tore his MCL, I believe, at the end of last season and missed like the last five games, including the playoffs. I don't know if this is residual from that. I actually think I read that it was a new injury, but regardless of what it is, he's not healthy right now. He's not participating right now. So he needs to become healthy at some point in this offseason, ready for training camp, ready to go in the preseason, especially ready to go in the regular season. We need to see him on the field early on so Cam Akers can't just completely run away with this job. If he's healthy, step two is sort of a choose-your-own-adventure situation here. Number one, Cam Akers gets hurt again. Nobody wants to see that happen, but in this hypothetical world where Daryl Henderson is maximizing his dynasty value, that's one of the avenues to it happening. So Akers gets hurt again. Henderson steps in. A healthy Henderson as the lead running back on the Rams, he would absolutely smash. Like, he would just be incredible. He would be a league winner in, in redraft leagues. He would win people their dynasty leagues from off the bench. He would be, he, he might be one of the lead rushers in the league. He would, he would probably have a thousand yards easily. And then at that point, he enters, he enters free agency. This is the last year of his deal. He would get a bag. If Akers got hurt, he stepped in and smashed, became a free agent. He's getting the bag. The other avenue here is that they kind of like split time. I know a lot of people are just kind of assuming Cam Akers runs away with this job, regardless of what happens with Daryl Henderson. I could kind of see them splitting carries more than a lot of people think, given that Henderson's been so good, given that Akers has been, you know, kind of volatile on a per touch basis. And given the injuries, they might want to kind of use a split backfield here. I think that would be the, probably the best use of, of the talent on their team. And so if they split time, 
Henderson is an efficient like 1B on this team. Free agency comes. He gets a Chase Edmonds type deal you know, to go, you know, chase the money somewhere else. He's a little bit younger than that. And so that that's the path, is that he's healthy. He gets a solid role in this offense, whether Akers gets hurt or not. Free agency comes, he cashes in. Or even before he signs, you know, people like to, you know, leap up in value, like make assumptions about where these guys are going to go, what kind of money are they going to get. You could cash out at that point. And so... That's the path to Daryl Henderson jumping into the top 30 running backs in Dynasty from outside the top 50 right now. Kenny Gainwell, TDP, Isaiah Spiller, Daryl Henderson. I think these guys are all decent shots in late in Dynasty drafts. If I was kind of ranking the odds that they enter the top 30, um, I'd probably say, I don't know, I might say Daryl Henderson is probably the most likely. And then TDP just kind of feels like a toss-up given we don't know what's going to happen in San Francisco. I don't know. And then maybe Isaiah Spiller and then Gainwell. I, you know, I'm not sure. All these guys kind of have similar chances, but take shots on these guys. That's the end of the video. Thanks for checking it out. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter. Have a great week. Have a good weekend. Peace.